Hello and welcome to DU's 20th Annual Diversity Summit. We're glad you could join us for this session. In the spirit of healing and peace, we acknowledge and honor the indigenous peoples of the land upon which University of Denver stands, the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute tribes. A few reminders before we get started. This year, we as a DU community will be exploring the interplay and intersections of the impact of 2020 through a lens of anti-racism and anti-discrimination. Together, we will examine the many ways in which our collective past informs our shared diversity, equity, and inclusion work for the future. For some, the topics covered may include triggering or emotionally challenging topics. Please feel free to exit the event and return later as necessary. We will be closely monitoring our time together and do not condone threatening or violent language. Rather, this space is meant to provide us opportunities to learn, question, and grow. We hope you will join us in this journey. Please note, unlike other Diversity Summit events, this is not a webinar. We will be using breakout rooms during this session. If you would like closed captioning, please use breakout room one. Please keep your microphone muted until participation is required. Please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen for you to ask questions of the panelists. We will attempt to answer as many questions as possible. The conversation is being recorded and will be made available on Canvas within a week of this event. Here's a quick reminder of the Zoom controls. Please take a moment to locate the chat, close caption, and leave buttons at the bottom of your screen. Lastly, we ask that you share your experience via social media. We will be using hashtag DU Diversity Summit throughout these seven weeks. Now I would like to introduce Dr. Marie Berry, our moderator for this Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much, Mari. Thank you to the, um, to the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for hosting this remarkable series of events. Um, and thank you to all of you who are, who are here in the, in the Zoom room this morning. Um, I, I wanna take a few minutes to, to kind of quickly introduce myself. And I want to invite you, I know that um, most of these events are a webinar, but I've asked for this to be uh, a, a, a kind of a more traditional Zoom room for the purpose of cultivating a community conversation. And so I want to just um, encourage you, if you'd like, to, to leave your camera on. Um, of course, no pressure to do so. Um, I'd encourage you to, to, to chime into the chat, um, to be interactive and engaged. And I will have um, some, some opportunities for us to, to, to really have a conversation together about this concept of intersectionality um, and the goal uh, really, which is the focus of my, of my um, kind of time here today is how do we, how do we use this, this framework of intersectionality to do the work we wanna do in the world, to do the work that I think many of us are committed to, to building a kind of a more free world for more people, um, a, a world that, is, that has justice and equity um, uh, at its center. Um, and so, you know, in that spirit, I just want to um, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Marie Berry. I'm a professor at the Joseph Corbell School at the University of Denver. Um, I've, this is my sixth year as a, on faculty at DU. Um, and I'm, I'm really um, uh, grateful to have been able to be part of this, this community for, for six years. And I look forward to, you know, being part of it going forward. Um, my work focuses primarily on the impact of war on women, and this this uh, has brought me in my in the course of my research to to do many interviews and to meet many women who have lived through armed conflict um, in Bosnia, in Rwanda, in Sri Lanka, Colombia, Nepal, um, and, and and other places as well. Now I've been tremendously privileged. Uh, to be able to, to do a lot of this work. And one of the themes that's come up in this work over and over again is the importance of thinking about uh, an intersectional framework when we try to build peace or to empower women in the aftermath of armed conflict. Um, and what I've seen too often where a lot of my work has really focused in the last couple of years is the way in which so many programs focused on women affected by war treat women only uh, as women rather than as women who are also racialized, uh, classed, uh, 
um, and, and from different caste or religious backgrounds, from different abilities, different ages, uh, different sexualities or gender expressions. These are all sort of other axes and, and um, uh, of, of women's identities that really are salient and matter. Um, and yet I see too often in my work the way in which those identities are not necessarily um, embedded or included in, uh, in, in programming or other sorts of um, uh, interventions really designed to support women in the aftermath of armed conflict. So I, I give you this context because I want to say that I am in no way an expert on intersectionality. This is not necessarily the focus of my research, but it's something that comes up over and over again in, in my work. And, and in my teaching and in my politics. And so that's really the position that I come to this presentation with. Um, and I, you know, and, and I, don't, I don't have all the answers, um, but I would like to kind of invite a conversation with all of you. Let me share my screen. And um, throughout my presentation today, if you have a question, please raise your hand using the raise hand function or simply chime in and, and unmute yourself and just kind of jump in because um, sometimes it's a little tricky to see the raise hand function when I have a shared screen up. So, so, so today we're going to talk about building intersectional coalitions. Um, and I, I want to do this, uh, this, this, this workshop today in four different parts. So I want to start with the kind of the basics. What is intersectionality? And for some of you, this may be really review. And for some, perhaps this is a kind of a needed a needed um, uh, kind of 101 on what intersectionality really is and where the concept comes from. I then want to talk about uh, what Kimberly Crenshaw has called intersectional failures, the way in which oftentimes historically efforts to really um, to, to secure social change have sometimes neglected to have an intersectional lens in a way that has been detrimental for the success, the durability of the goals or of the movements. Then I want to talk about one of my kind of main goals in, in my own life right now and also in my teaching and in my politics, which is what we need to do more often, I think, is, is, is really kind of reflect on a bold vision for the future. I think we oftentimes are limited in our um, understanding of where things might go by what exists today, by what is here. And um, what abolitionist and even kind of anarcho-syndicalist and other approaches have actually invited us to do is to really imagine what, what a world looks like that we want to live in, in which everybody has everything that they need. And I, would, I will argue today that intersectional frameworks are necessary for us to be able to get to those visions of a, of a more free world. And then finally, I'm going to kind of give a couple of examples and invite them from all of you about how about about this kind of successful or or movements currently that are that are building intersectional coalitions, um, and so we'll sort of kind of take it through those four or four sections over the next hour or so. So, as part of the one hundred and one, what is intersectionality? Now, I, I like to think of intersectionality really, really um, uh, clearly as a framework rather than as something um, that is in the world. I think of it as a framework because I think that is quite um, uh, consistent with what Kimberly Crenshaw articulated in her 1989 article that, it, that really for the first time put the concept of intersectionality into the kind of into the world as a clearly kind of defined concept and really framework for thinking about the law. Now, this, this, this concept comes from sort of obscure sort of legal situations. And, and the way that I won't kind of go into the, the, the details of Crenshaw's um, uh, articulation, but I will summarize just to say that what she was really engaging with was, were a series of court cases in which black women found themselves not to be a protected class that was able to advance a particular set of yeah, discrimination claims because all of the statutes that existed were either for women or they were about race. And so what was blind, what the court was blind to is the way in which women who are also, who are black have these intersecting forms of discrimination by virtue of the fact that they are both women and black. So the, the, the laws on the books were focused on racial discrimination and gender discrimination, but not the intersection of those two things. And so this is really where the term comes from. Now, 
Um, one of the things that, so, so the, the kind of simplest definition of intersectionality is that it's, it, it is a framework for understanding how aspects of a person's identities, their, their gender, their race, their class, their caste, their, their ability, um, their, their sexuality, their gender expression, so on and so forth, how these aspects of a person's identity combine to create advantage or disadvantage in different contexts. So one of the key things here to keep in mind is that intersectionality is, is, a, is a framework that allows for fluidity we understand that, that, that advantage and disadvantage are relational and situational. So in one context in which my race and my gender um, and, my, um, and my ability may be an advantage, in another situation under other conditions and in interaction with other people or institutions, these could actually create disadvantage, right? So um, it's not about, about necessarily identity and representation as much as, as it is about training us to think about the structural and systemic sort of systems that create inequality, that create advantage and disadvantage. These systems are systems of, sort of, of racism, of patriarchy, right? Um, and and these, this, this framework is really designed for us to focus our attention on how these systems operate to create advantage or disadvantage um, in different contexts for different, differently situated individuals, okay? Now, what intersectionality is, well, let me actually give you one more, one more um, uh, kind of um, expression from Kimberly Crenshaw's work real quick. So, um, you know, to, to kind of re-summarize actually what I just said, Crenshaw really articulated that Black women in, in her um, article face both racism and sexism within society, right? But rather than see those situations or those experiences as separate, intersectionality demands that we see that juncture between race and gender as, as a site of, 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 of revealing the different systems that create inequality in the world. So kind of in a nutshell, intersectionality is this idea that we can experience different forms of, of oppression at the same time or different forms of advantage at the same time, um, depending on the context. And that these forms of oppression really can't be compartmentalized or treated as separate categories. They have to be considered as part of the whole and in relation to each other, okay? So let me, let me just quickly kind of review what intersectionality is not. Um, and this is designed actually really just to kind of summarize some of the things I've heard talking about these concepts, even, even I, that I hear, I see as a professor in writing that I get from students and from others. Um, which, which the most common thing is that intersectionality is kind of a synonym for just intersection, right? So I, I hear a lot of times people say, well, the intersectionality of, um, of, of um, you know, uh, the UN, the World, the World Bank, and the World Trade Organization, or something like that. I'm like, no, 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 no. So the key here is, is it's not a synonym for everything. It's, it's a framework for understanding the systematic drivers of inequality. That are that that combine in different identities, right? It's about that juncture in which people's identities overlap, right? So the other thing that intersectionality is not, and this is really important, is that it's not a sanctioning of hierarchy. In fact, Kimberly Crenshaw's entire idea in articulating intersectionality was really to dismantle hierarchy, right? And by hierarchy, I'm referring to the sort of structuring of a society around dominance and oppression. And oftentimes the way in which um, in a patriarchal society, there is a dominance of kind of men over women. In a, in a, ra a racist society, a dominance of white people over people of color, right? In a, in a, a heteronormative kind of society, the way in which straight people um, kind of are, 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 are um, have more power than um, people of different, uh, you know, sexualities or gender expressions. Th this intersectionality is not a sanctioning of that, right? It's actually a way of critiquing that hierarchy and trying to dismantle that hierarchy. And so there is no, this, 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 this is not a way of trying to say, um, I have six different, 
um, identities that makes me more oppressed than other people, or I have six different, you know, marginalized identities. I am more oppressed than other people. It's not about a sanctioning of that. And it's not about box checking, right? It's not about saying I have, you know, there was actually a study at some point that where people were trying to identify all the different identities that they had and kind of compare which ones, you know, they had versus other people had. And that's really not what this is about. Again, this is about a framework for understanding the underlying structures of oppression in the world. Um, and so it's not a, a new caste system, a, a hierarchy of victimhood, a special standard. These are all quotes that I take directly from, from writing um, that has really proliferated, particularly among the kind of um, far right in the United States politically. Um, which has which has uh, critiqued intersectionality and this framework as as highly problematic, and I think, um, frankly, that th those those um, ana uh, th that analysis misses what intersectionality is all about and what it really is 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 um, as as a way of kind of seeing the the different um, interlocking and overlapping oppressions that exist within us. Okay, that's the kind of one on one now. I, 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 I articulated the kind of goals for this webinar or this, this workshop today through the words of Audre Lorde. Um, and, and this is partly because while Kimberly Crenshaw was the one who first, first um, defined and, and clarified the concept of intersectionality, um, this is not a new concept, especially among black feminist writers. Um, the Combahee River Collective talked extensively about the kind of idea of intersectionality, basically saying that, um, you know, the, the major systems of oppression are interlocking and it's the synthesis of oppression that creates the conditions of our lives. And Audre Lorde wrote, ad, she, she, she wrote extensively about this idea of kind of interlock, interlocking oppression. So she talked about um, how these interlocking oppressions are also a way of uh, forging um, uh, forging division, and instead of and and and, and basically, she clearly kind of and, and robustly writes repeatedly about the the dangers of that and the way in which um, difference is not a, a a politics of difference is actually one of strength, not one of division. It's not one of hierarchy. It's one of solidarity. And so th this these um, th these are sort of kind of you know precursors, if you will, to the kind of articulation that Crenshaw offered. So I just want to you know bring in Audre Lorde's words here. And for those of you who haven't had a chance to read her essay, "The Master's Tools Will Never Dismantle the Master's House," I will make sure that this is posted in the resources for this workshop. Um, but it's one of the most powerful two-page sort of short essays. Um, that that continues to shape so much kind of feminist writing and thinking and, and theorizing. And she writes in that essay, advocating for the mere tolerance of difference between women is the grossest reformism. It is a total denial of the creative function of difference in our lives. Difference must not merely be tolerated, but must be seen as a fund of necessary polarities between which our creativity can spark like a dialectic. Only then does the necessity for interdependency become unthreatening. Only within that interdependency of different strengths acknowledged and equal can the power to seek new ways of being in the world generate, as well as the courage and sustenance to act where there are no charters. She continues, and she writes, as women, we have been taught either to ignore our differences or to view them as causes for separation and suspicion rather than as forces for change. Without community, there is no liberation, only the most vulnerable and temporary armistice between an individual and her oppression. But community must not mean the shedding of our differences nor the pathetic pretense that these differences do not exist, okay? So I, I, I share those words in, 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 their, in their kind of whole here with you, although that's certainly not the whole essay, because I think what I, what I want to offer is, is the spirit of those words as the importance of difference and even of the embracing of a politic of difference while constantly dismantling the tendency to create a hierarchy of these different identities, right? And so what we, what, what Lord asks us to do is to think about how strength, 
and creativity is forged through difference, right? Um, but that the, the ignoring these differences, she calls it the grossest reformism, right? This, this, this way of, of actually creating division and by creating division, actually creating hierarchy, um, which is the ultimate sort of thing that, that, that removes the power of movements for justice. Okay, so let me let me get into some of these concepts a little bit more clearly um, by looking at a couple of historical cases of what Crenshaw would call intersectional failures. These intersectional failures, we can really see kind of where they missed this idea that difference is something that exists and yet is not something that can, and cannot be kind of suppressed and and and. Um, and wiped away, but instead has to be something that's called forward centered, acknowledged and, and, um, and, and, and in doing so find ways to create strength out of those differences. All right, the first one I wanna talk about is the movement for suffrage. And this is, this is something that's come up a lot over the last couple of years, as we've seen the 100th anniversary, sort of the passing or, and the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Now, you may have heard many kind of names like Susan B. Anthony or Elizabeth Cady Stanton. These are sort of the, the, um, the names that, that I certainly was taught growing up uh, were the kind of leading suffragists. And, um, uh, when we, it's kind of starting, this is a, a rendition of the Seneca Falls Convention in 1849, I think it was, 1848. And this kind of early, early sort of uh, uh, um, meeting of, of suffragists beginning to demand the right for women to vote was very tied to the same sort of political circles that were advocating for the ending of the system of enslaved labor in the United States. And so the kind of earliest articulations of this idea of civil rights and of, of equal rights was one of, of shared, of, of largely kind of shared mobilization and energy between abolitionist movements and suffragist movements. However, as the turn of the 20th century happened, it, and, and especially kind of in the, in the decades um, in the late 1800s, after the end of the Civil War, there became a recognition among on the part of many white women, especially white middle class women, that that there they so. Can someone just let me know if there's um? I can you see? I'm just assuming you can see my my PowerPoint screen. Cool. Okay. Thank you, AJ. <laughs> awesome. Um. All right, everybody. So I'll keep going. Sorry about the, the the kind of dropped Zoom there. No idea what's going on, but that's that's the world we live in now, and it's no big deal. So thanks for coming back. Um, so I was I was basically talking about how in the at the end of the 1800s or the kind of end of the 19th century, the the there there was sort of a, a political calculation on the part of many uh, white women that were in the suffragist movement who began to recognize that they really needed to um, uh, kind of, uh, they might need, I should say, some of them believed this, um, to separate themselves from the broader movement for civil rights and, and kind of uh, against the system of enslaved labor um, and instead kind of just, just advocate for their own self-interest in terms of the right to vote. Um, and so I'm gonna show you a picture of a, of a this is a, a march in 1913. So this is sort of um, after the turn of the century where the movement for suffrage became really, really strong. And in this particular march, which was in, ninth, which was in New York City, um, white suffragists told black suffragists um, that they needed to march in a separate uh, assembly in the back of the parade. Um, instead of with their state delegations, which is kind of what you see here. Uh, Ida B. Wells kind of famously refused to do this. Um, Ida B. Wells is a very, was a very, very staunch kind of um, uh, ab uh, abolitionist and suffragist, uh, you know, kind of champion for women's rights and for black women's rights. Um, and yet uh, many others actually did show up and thought it would still be effective to, to maintain a, a union between the kind of, between white women and black women in this movement for the vote. Now, um, there was there were many allegations at the time, though, that all of the sort of early synergy and early energy 
between black women and white women was more or less kind of thrown under the bus mm -hmm. when there was in, in the kind of um, uh, final days where the movement for suffrage became really, really pronounced. And so when, when, when the vote was extended to women via the 19th Amendment, much of the energy around, around securing access to the vote um, especially for, for Black women and for Black men as well who were living in the South, where Jim Crow laws became the law of the land and other informal barriers to vote, voting and formal barriers became extremely sort of difficult to circumvent to be able to, to actually go to the polls. Um, everything from poll taxes to blat blatant threats and discrimination um, were were you know were used and, and continue still to this day uh, to 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 disenfranchise people from the right to vote, and of course there's a lot of conversations around the the kind of connections here to the prison system to the carceral system, um, and films like Thirteenth or uh, Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow talk about the extension of this kind of discrimination and 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 disenfranchisement of Black Americans. Uh, as a result of kind of the felon and, and kind of carceral system. Um, and, you know, and today we have millions and millions and millions of people in this country who are disenfranchised from the right to vote. So I, I, sh I give you this example as a way of talking about the suffrage movement as an intersectional failure. There was, an, there was a kind of strategic decision made by white women that said, you know what, we need to kind of basically pursue our self-interests, which is our right to vote, and not make it a broader conversation around kind of civil rights, racial justice, um, and to ensure that all women have the right to vote, right? Here's another example kind of from the United States of another intersectional failure, as I'd put it, which is the early movement for reproductive rights. So the early movement for reproductive rights kind of comes around in the same period of time as I was just speaking about with the movement for suffrage. At the end of the 19th century, there was sort of a, a booming sort of um, conversation around this idea of voluntary motherhood. This is kind of a funny uh, uh, image where you can see the woman batting off a stork who's trying to give her another baby. Um, and so this this idea that women wanted more autonomy over their ability to control their reproductive choices. When they had a child, how many child children they would have, how, how many years would be between children and so on and so forth. The problem is this early sort of conversation around, around voluntary motherhood and birth control comes in the same context in which black women uh, via the system of enslaved labor in the United States were um, it, it, you know, uh, uh, violently oppressed and abused as by virtue of their reproductive capacity. So one of the kind of footnotes in, in and, and I think it's a, it deserves much more kind of foregrounding in our, in our historical sort of conversations about the period, which is that when the, 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 the international trade in enslaved labor was formally abolished um, in 1808, Part of the reason for that ending was that, that um, uh, was that large kind of plantation owners, largely in the south of the United States, felt that they could make more money by introducing breeding schemes, where they forced through oftentimes through violence um, enslaved women to bear more children, because bearing more children was a way of reproducing their property and gaining a tremendous amount of wealth. And there's indeed some some quite uh, 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 astonishingly racist and horrific statements made by several of our founder, founding fathers about the kind of way in which their wealth was created uh, through these breeding schemes, if you will. So this, this kind of deliberate exploitation of women goes hand in hand with these kind of, uh, you know, around the same time period as these conversations around the kind of merits of birth control. And, and what, what, of course, this misses um, is the, what, what, what our kind of understanding of the early conversations around birth control misses is the way in which white women framed the, the conversation around um, uh, voluntary motherhood as something for them, whereas for black women, it was a way of, of ensuring that they didn't have so many children, All right? So Margaret Sanger, kind of early, uh, and, and, and very, you know, kind of oftentimes held in high esteem, champion of reproductive rights and reproductive um, uh, um, services like, like birth control and, and so on and so forth. 
um, is on the record of saying that the reason we need birth control is to liberate white women from their, their um, constant childbearing, right? Give them more autonomy, but then also in a very paternalistic and racist way, talking about preventing black women, immigrants, and the poor in general from reproducing beyond their quote unquote means. Now, there's, there's, there's a, 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 a remarkable historical record here too of the way in which the turn of the, the century and the conversations around eugenics that were even adopted by people like Teddy Roosevelt um, started talking about birth control as a way of preventing white racial death this idea that white people in the United States would be outnumbered by people of color and that this was somehow alarming and, and problematic. And so this leads in, so you know, what we see here is the way in which this, there, there's an intersectional failure, right? Because we see the, the advancement of this idea of, 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 of bodily autonomy through the kind of, um, through the reproductive rights movement. Um, depends on a logic, a political logic of, of, of racism, right? Of, of actually saying that we, we, one group deserves uh, more bodily autonomy and the other group needs to have um, the state likely intervene in their own reproductive autonomy, right? And so this, this is, this is a, a, a profound failure. Um, and, and we see this to this day, the legacies of this, the way in which there are kind of um, uh, very different kind of levels of, of, of coercion and of, of comfort uh, with different reproductive um, uh, mechanisms, including abortion and the way, and, and really it's, it's the way, the, it, the motivation behind the reproductive justice movement, which is an incredibly important movement to talk about um, women's, especially black women's ability to bear children and to mother the children that they have um, and to choose you know, when and, and when not to have children. Now, it's, it's important here to kind of, I mean, this is, a, this is the a topic for a whole lecture itself and I won't go into details, but it's really important to know that the conversation around birth control and reproductive rights was, was in parallel to this eugenics discourse for many different people. And so um, uh, we actually see the kind of legal and political implementation of this discourse, which was through eugenics policies or, or through a ster forcible sterilization policies that were on the books in 26 states by the early 1930s. And so you see kind of in the historical record, the way in which a discourse around birth control and population control went hand in hand for particularly situated individuals, white women, it was about voluntary motherhood for others women of color, it was around population control, right? And so these, this is really um, a, a, an intersectional failure, if you will. Dorothy Roberts in her remarkable book, Killing the Black Body, um, talks about this. And she says, you know, for white women, birth control was a symbol of reproductive liberty, right? But for black women, the language of birth control or the language of eugenics did more than legitimate birth control. It defined the purpose of birth control, shaping the meaning of reproductive freedom. Birth control became a means of controlling a population rather than a means of increasing women's reproductive autonomy. Okay, so I want to ask you all, who whoever is here still, not very many of you, I think, but um, I want to ask you if you can think of any other intersectional failures. Are there any other intersectional failures that you uh, can point to? in the world today or different events or movements that have neglected to take a politic of difference seriously. And by neglecting to take a politic of difference seriously have created disadvantage and new forms of oppression for, for say women in those two examples that I just gave you. But of course it can be much broader than that as well. Any, any thoughts, anyone in the, in the, in the audience can think of any of these. Thanks, Marie. I can't, but I will say that was so eye-opening. It was just for me, and so I'm embarrassed to say maybe that that is the case, but that was, it was just very eye-opening and, and oh. awareness increasing, so thank you. Dennis, thank you. That's very kind. Um, uh, well, you know, and, and fine to not have ideas either. Let me give you a couple kind of from the top of my head right now, and then we can kind of think about um, 
you know, where, where the kind of the point of thinking about the failures is a way of then saying, hey, how can we build movements for better worlds that, that, that avoid these pitfalls, right? That do not reinforce the same sort of racial hierarchy that they purport you know, well, one of one of the main things I want to convey to all of you today is the way in which hierarchies sustain each other, right? So in in the attempt to dismantle a gender hierarchy, one of men over women, there was a maintenance of the racial hierarchy of white over black, right? And and we could not fully get to a world in which more more people are more free, right? with those hierarchies intact. So what intersectionality asks us to do is to think about ways, really, it, it's a framework that can help us dismantle those, right? Because we can say Black women who are needing the right, you know, who are seeking the right to vote are facing particular forms of structural discrimination in accessing the vote. And so we need then the suffered because any woman is going to face additional hurdles to vote, all women have to be concerned with dismantling those additional structures, those structural barriers, right? So Audre Lorde said this beautifully, there is no, you know, there, it, there, there, I am not free while any woman is unfree, right? So the, you know, the, this whole idea of, of building movements that don't create new forms of oppression and new forms of hierarchy are, is really the goal, I think with social justice work. So one of the intersectional failures that always comes to my mind is the Women's March, which I think is largely, you know, what was largely a very successful, very, very um, globally impactful um, uh, response to the initial election of Trump in 2016. And many people who who were, you know, there's been there's been much written about this. I've written about this. Other people have written about this. The way in which there was sort of a um, a, a blindness to the kind of, uh, uh, to the way in which even things like the pink hats felt like they were rooted in the white experience and in white women's experience rather than in a broader sort of uh, understanding of, of, of all women's um, experiences. And so, you know, there's a lot written on this and, and there's, there's similar things right now going on with, with, um, with the sort of um, turfs, the sort of, uh, the transphobia that exists within some feminist or pseudo-feminist circles, and the, this idea, you know, that again, um, that that we can somehow dismantle a gender hierarchy while preserving a hetero hierarchy, right, or a cis hierarchy, is is one that I think is 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 actually just theoretically wrong, um, and 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 will not get us to the place we want to get to. So, you know, we we could talk more about this, but so why are they failures, right? These 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 movements had these intersectional failures because they allowed in in trying to dismantle one form of inequality, they reinforced other forms of inequality in trying to dismantle gender inequality, the reinforced racial inequality and trying to and trying to dismantle gender inequality, they reinforce cis hierarchy, right? Um, or cis inequality. So this in cis meaning kind of um, uh, cisgender as in, you know, for those not familiar, this, the people that, that have that have a gender expression that is uh, in alignment with the, the kind of the, the sexual body that they that they had at birth, right? Um, so, so these failures I note to basically ask us to think about how we can take intersectionality more seriously in working to build a better world. And I would, you know, with more people in the room would ask you right now to kind of chime in the chat um, and tell me sort of um, a couple of things that you, that you, that you care about. So some of the things that you were committed to as part of your political or your social engagement? What are things that matter to you? What are issues in the world that you are um, interested in and that you care about? Even things that make you mad, right? Things that keep you up at night. What are the, what are some of the things? There's so many things, right? There's so many things I think that, that drive a lot of us to do justice work. Um, and there's there's no kind of right or wrong answer, but, but for those of you who are engaged, think about some of those things that drive you right now, right? And if you feel like sharing in the chat, please do. Um, but but uh, but if you wanna just kind of keep it to yourself, 
Um, that's fine too. Mari, oh, Mari chimed in earlier. Thank you, Mari. Yes, I think that's right. I, sorry, I didn't see that earlier. But if anyone wants to chime into the chat about these, you know, these, 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 the big things that you care about, right? So for me, I mean, this can be anything from climate change and the fact that, oh my Lord, like we're, we're increasingly heading towards an unlivable planet, right? To uh, police violence against people of color and black people in particular, right? Um, good, Dennis, this idea of, yes, right? Incarcerated people receiving COVID vaccines or not receiving COVID vaccines, right? Uh, totally, right? And, and this idea that, so that, I think that one of the things that makes me angry that I care deeply about is our carceral system and, and the way in which about a third of all Americans are touched by the carceral system by somebody in prison in their lives. This includes me, um, you know, includes many, many people who have family members, people they love um, in prison. You know, this, this idea that people are not being given COVID vaccines, but the vast majority, or not vast majority, but many, many people who are in prisons are actually not even, haven't even really been charged with a crime, haven't been convicted of a crime at least. Um, they're oftentimes in holding cells, right? Or they're in there for nonviolent crimes or for drug crimes, right? So, you know, there's so many, so many sort of issues, I think, related to the prison system, related to policing, um, related to economic inequality, related to hunger, right? One in five children in America has been hungry this year. I mean, this is a really astounding um, uh, kind of uh, gut punch to this idea that capitalism is lifting all boats, right? Uh, that everybody's getting better off, right? We're seeing hunger hit our, our kids in ways that I think are really um, morally alarming, right? Um, so, so what I what I what I want to get out of this this exercise, um, which you can do now with me, or you can do later, or if anyone watches the video in the future, you can kind of do on your own time. But it's it's an exercise to really begin to think about why and where an intersectional framework might matter for doing this work towards building a better world. Now, I'm going to share with you something that um, that I care deeply about, which is this is an issue of reproductive rights and reproductive justice. You may have picked up on that uh, from, from the kind of examples I just used. Um, but I wanna use something that really alarmed me this last year and likely alarmed many of you as well, which was the reports coming out of an ICE detention facility um, uh, uh, in, 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 um, in, uh, called Irwin Detention Facility. Um, that is owned by LaSalle, which is a private prison corporation, um, where there were reports coming out, not only of medical neglect and the lack of um, access to treatment, non-treatment for COVID, there were m many, many reports of uh, neglect coming out, people not getting tested when they showed symptoms, things like that. But really, really alarmingly, there was these reports about mass um, hysterectomies this idea that there was a really, really um, deeply insidious kind of medical abuse going on within the, within the, the detention facility. Now, so, so I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just kind of offer that this is one of the things that really kept me up at night for the last couple, like when I heard about this, when I read about this and, and actually when um, you can actually listen, there's a, there's a wonderful Democracy Now! episode um, with one of the women who was able to escape the, the hysterectomy, but, tells a chilling story about how many people were really trying to push her towards this totally unnecessary medical procedure um, as a result of her yeah, of her detention in this facility. And keep in mind, nobody was in this facility for committing crimes. This is um, a facility for immigration violations. And so it was a it was kind of wait, waiting pre pre deportation proceedings. Now, I want you to think about those things that you care about. And I want you to imagine a circle. And I want you to put that thing that you care about at the center of a circle, uh, at the center of the circle, right? So imagine something that looks kind of like this, a series of circles. And at the center is that is that harm or that issue that you care about, okay? So for some of you, it may be nice to draw this. For others, you know, and, and, and I, it, you know, stick with me here if, if, if this feels, um, kind of odd or if this feels lame, uh, I, I, I challenge you to, to, to stick with it and give it a try. Um, but to put something that you care about, something in the world you care about at the center of that circle. So I'm sharing with you mine. 
Now, I want you to then think about who are the people who are responsible for that particular harm? Who are the people or the institutions that are directly responsible for that harm? Who are the people who actually committed that harm, right? And so for this, the, the kind of, here I'm thinking there's reports coming out that the prison administration or the uh, LaSalle kind of prison employees were taking women to the, this the particular doctor uh, with a, with, um, without giving them full information about what, what the doctor was about, um, that they were taking them for, for things like cramps. They would take them for the, to this doctor rather than treat it more kind of casually. So I'm thinking about the prison administration. I'm also thinking about the doctor. There's a doctor, one doctor who's named in all the complaints who, um, who performed these, these medically unnecessary hysterectomies um, and thereby created the sterilized in kind of layman's terms, those, those, the, these women um, who oftentimes were only coming in for issues like cramps or sometimes like a, um, like a um, uh, um, cysts uh, on, their, on their ovaries or something like that, right? So much more minor sort of medical procedures would have been suitable. I'm also thinking about the hospital staff that surrounded that doctor who defended the doctor's decisions and who carried through with the kind of some of the day-to-day -day bureaucracy around actually performing these medically unnecessary procedures, right? So that's, so I'm gonna draw in that initial circle outside of the center, these, those actors, those people who, who actually were, were complicit and responsible for this harm, right? Okay, now most, most of our kind of criminal justice system, if you will, is focused on holding that level of, of perpetrator accountable, right? So the doctor is going to be charged, right? Um, and the prison, there's, there's calls for investigation into LaSalle as a company and into the individual prison administrators, et cetera, et cetera. And there was a con actually a congressional in kind of um, investigation into these reports. And so a bunch of Congress people actually went down and interviewed member uh, women who had been held in these facilities and, and so on and so forth. So, so we kind of see the, the perpetrators at that level, but I wanna think bigger. And I want you to think who might be responsible for the construction of a framework or a system in which women are vulnerable to this type of, of medically unnecessary procedure or violence. Um, people who think about who, are, who, are, who is supporting the prison administration, who is making it possible for the hospital staff to actually engage in these types of, of, um, of, of procedures, right? So think about that next layer. Who's in that next layer, right? So here, here's who I came up with, and this is not an exhaustive list, but you know, ICE as an institution, right, is responsible for some of this, right? Because ICE exists in this very strange uh, um, kind of uh, territory to, to police immigration, right? But not to put, put, where immigration is a crime, even though we know that actually under international law, many people who are seeking asylum in the United States end up getting into ICE's custody, um, even though they're legally able to seek asylum in the United States under international law and so on and so forth. We also know that prisons for profits, right? This is a thing. There's, you know, maybe 10% or more, although Joe Biden's presidency just changed some of this, um, there is a real kind of egregious industry around the prison system in the United States, whether it's the whole entire um, institution is privately um, constructed, owned and operated, or sometimes it's just parts of it, like the food, the food industry, the, you know, the cleaning, things like that are part of um, this private for-profit industry. All right, then we have the US immigration system, right? We have this immigration system that has really created a very militarized border. Um, and uh, and, and um, you know, uh, uh, policies like family separation and things like that that are really questionable and, you know, morally uh, uh, difficult, I think, for, for most people to, to kind of stomach. We also have something around um, racism uh, that, that manifests through language discrimination. One of the things that came out in the uh, documents about this, this, these procedures is that the woman who was able to speak English was better able to advocate for her not getting the medical procedures, whereas women who spoke Spanish um, and I believe Mandarin 
um, were were more li- were more likely to be forcibly subjected to these procedures in part because they didn't fully understand what the procedures were and there was not an effort made to give them full consent in in a language that they spoke. Privatization in general, kind of another thing that's that's uh, perhaps structuring this, where hospital staff um, is is uh, and prison administration is kind of privately operated separately from the um, kind of institutional bureaucracy in which they existed. Okay, I want you to think now about this or about your own issue that you put in the center of your own circle, okay? Um, And then I want you to think about the big systems, the systems that we were talking about earlier, the systems that an intersectional framework actually helps us begin to see. What are the systems that are allowing for privatization that are allowing for the U.S. immigration system to look as it does, so that allow prisons to profit, prisons for profit to exist, right? What are the systems that create the, the, the ecosystem in which these different actors, these different systems are, are able to, to operate and cause harm, okay? So, you know, there's many that you could name. Here are some that I named, right? Um, you know, I, I'm going to name the patriarchy, the way in which there is a kind of a commodification of women's bodies um, by this doctor and by these prison officials in which their minor medical concerns were treated in this really horrific way, right? There, there's, um, there's also much more kind of um, uh, conversations uh, to be had around why these women were even incarcerated in the first place. I'm going to blame the militarized border regime, the way in which people are being imprisoned instead of simply allowed to live their lives after having committed no crime except for being in the country sometimes for 20 years before getting um, arrested and thrown into these ICE detention facilities, right? I'm going to I'm going to name imperialism because so much of the drivers of of refugee flows from Central and South America are a result of Cold War politics that the U.S. engaged in, um, including the ousting of democratically elected liberal leftist regimes, but for fear of communism, the kind of forcible ousting of these regimes was uh, the, the U.S. policy in the 1980s, and then much of this policy continues in different ways um, through, at the top here, neoliberal economic policies, including CAFTA which has completely de- kind of changed the way in which rural economies work in Central America, driving up poverty and thus out migration, um, also driving up uh, and linked to the kind of formation and proliferation of, of, um, of uh, criminal enterprise and different cartels, which have also created tremendous insecurity in these, in these countries that is again, driving immigration. Okay, racial capitalism, right? The kind of idea, Cedric Robinson's idea of, of uh, Robinson's idea of, of the idea that capitalism can't be thought about as separate from racial capitalism because the creation of, and the ownership and the, and the construction of wealth was rooted in the United States and elsewhere in the world in the kind of owning of other people's bodies. And the production of actual, um, or in the creation of wealth came through this ownership over people and people bodies and then the labor that they produced in, in a way that was very racialized. Um, and so I think, you know, all, and then militarism linked to this idea of imperialism, right? Also linked to the idea that policing and ICE has become increasingly militarized um, over the past few decades. And we actually see the transfer of weapons from the military to, uh, you know, police forces around the country who are then using the, the, that type of weaponry and logics, the kind of counterinsurgency logics to, to, to actually incarcerate people who simply have fled fear um, of persecution in their home countries that is again linked to the same militarism that is then sending the, these weaponry and, and these systems to the policing forces, right? So these are all connected. And my point here, is that oftentimes when we think about blame for harm and we think about movements and how do we challenge this, right? The, the kind of our initial gut impression is like, we have to look at the people who did the bad thing, right? So we're gonna talk about that doctor and we're gonna, that doctor is gonna go to jail, right? The problem is 
in, in the long run, I think in this particular case and in, in, in any sort of individual case, right, that might make sense. And certainly this, this doctor is horribly complicit. Um, but when we, when we rely on the same systems to punish that are um, helping to cause the harm and to facilitate the harm in the first place, we're actually not creating the systemic change that we seek in the world, right? So simply by say, sending the, this individual doctor to jail, we're actually reinforcing the kind of the carceral system. And we are not fundamentally changing any of these things on the outer uh, two layers that are creating the conditions under which this doctor would be able to perform such horrific acts of violence against women, right? And so what, what I am asking us to do today is to think about how intersectionality as a framework can under, help us see as a lens the way in which imperialism and racial capitalism and patriarchy and militarized border regimes, all of those big underlying systems can Fine to structure disadvantage in people's lives. So these women be, that that are subjected to these medical um, this medical violence, if you will, these forced hysterectomies, are 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 positioned as immigrants, as non citizens. They're positioned as women of color. They're positioned as non native English speakers. They're positioned likely as people that were uh, working class. Um, and they're positioned also, uh, uh, many of them as people who have, who have um, uh, many which came out in the testimonies as people who have experienced tremendous trauma, right? And so this, the, how that shapes and how those different identities and experiences combine to create vulnerability in this context is, is, is where we then need to focus our energy on dismantling it, right? Because focusing solely on the doctor that created these, that, that performed these horrible things, leaves all these other systems intact. Okay, so the point, the point is, is that there, there, there needs to be in any sort of movement for justice and movement for change, a deep reckoning with the way in which um, oppressions are interlinked and overlapping and the way in which hierarchies sustain each other, the way in which a gender hierarchy too, too often sustains a racial hierarchy, which too often sustains a class hierarchy, right? And an ability hierarchy, so on and so forth. And so I take these words from Audre Lorde, from Martin Luther King, from so many other great thinkers as, as very seriously when they, they call our attention to the way in which we live in this kind of, this web, right? We live in, in this, as, 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 as King says, um, you know, an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny, right? Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And so here we have a call to think about how we build intersectional coalitions in a way that actually serves the goal and serves that purpose of building a world that is more free for more people. I, I, this third sort of section, and, and I, you know, we won't spend too much time on it, but the third sort of section that I wanted to really call in today is where, where we see our own role in doing this work and, and what, we, what, the real, what the work is really about, right? So if you're coming to the Diversity Summit in 2021, my guess is that you see that there are changes that need to exist in the world and you see yourself, hopefully, as part of building a world that is less oppressive, that is less unequal, um, you know, that is more free, again, for more people, as I always say. Um, and as such, as you, as, you, as you kind of think about your own role in this, my invitation to you today is to spend some time grounding your work in a vision of the future that you believe in and that you want to see come to fruition. Too often, I think we fail to let our imaginations uh, really conceive of what a more free world might look like. We think about all the institutions and structures and baggage and political systems and so on and so forth that exist in the world today and see those things as impossible to change. And they might be, right? They might be, but I would contend that more effective work, more effective movements and more effective advocacy for justice 
um, requires us to have an end goal that is guided, that, 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 is, that is clearly articulated in our own mind, that we, then are, that, that we are then able to come up with a set of values that we hold central to our own politics as we work towards that vision. So Audre Lorde hit on this idea of visions in that same essay that I keep articulate or that I keep re referencing to and that I set up this, this seminar to kind of speak with or speak to. She says, in a world of possibility for us all, our personal visions help lay the groundwork for political action, right? Um, Mariam Kaba, an incredible abolitionist today, talks about visions as a map. And Adrienne Mari Brown, somebody else who I cite often, talks about our visions as ropes through the devastation. I'm sorry if you can see my dog there. She's, she just apparently woke up from a little nap. Um, these visions, I, I, I contend, are important because they allow us to articulate a set of values that will help us get there, that will then prevent us from making these same intersectional mistakes going forward. Intersectional mistakes that create new oppression, that create new hierarchy, that create new forms of harm, all right? So when you have a chance, I would just want to invite you to think about what this might look like. Um, Mariam Kaba says that a restructured society is one in which we have everything we need, in which every human being has everything they need, food, shelter, education, health, art, beauty, clean water, and more, right? These things then become foundational to our personal and communal safety. And so it's hard to think about that world in which we, um, in which we see everyone being cared for, right? Because in the world that we live in day to day, that is just, we, systems of care are completely fractured and disrupted. So what does it look like to build intersectional coalitions for the goal of building a world that is more free for more people or that speaks to that vision that you independently have articulated for your own politics, for your own commitments and your own values, right? What does it mean? What does it look like to do that? Well, I would, I, I think we have a lot of places to draw inspiration from today. And while these movements that I'll, I'm going to talk about now are not necessarily perfect. Um, many of them um, you know, are, are grounded in different ways of leading, loving, and learning, right? Which is sort of this idea um, that, that, that we can foreground different priorities. Instead of hierarchy, we can foreground care and difference. Difference as a politic of strength rather than of division, right? Um, this is the core idea that intersectionality really brings us to. This idea that difference can can be you know can be um, can can be a creative force and a force of strength. All right, so I am uplifted by movements in the streets um, that have uh, you know challenged racial injustice. I'm uplifted by movements in Burundi that have challenged the kind of reign of the former president, or in Poland of the um, bans on abortion or in Sudan of the uh, kind of uh, decade-long regime of the dictator Omar al-Bashir. I'm uplifted by water protectors, by movements that have tried to create and, and foreground synergy with our ecology, with our env natural environment in the face of oppression from corporate interests and extractive industries. I'm uplifted by women who have formed human chains that are 300 plus miles long across Kerala in India, or Kerala in India, to build a women's wall stretching across the state to challenge patriarchal oppression. I'm uplifted by my hometown of Seattle, this idea of kayaktivists. It's one of the things I love talking about, the way in which kayaktivists have oftentimes thwarted and stopped different um, uh, uh, ships from coming into different harbors, uh, creating these human barricades to prevent drilling and other forms of exploitation of our natural environment. I'm uplifted by the experiment, the radical experiment in Rojava, uh, in which there has been the creation of a feminist sort of communalist society that has 
defeated ISIS and also created some of the most democratic and egalitarian um, um, communal sort of uh, forms of living that we've ever seen um, in the middle of Syria. Uh, I'm uplifted by the movement over decades in Argentina against femicide and also for women's bodily autonomy and right to abortion, which was recently passed. I'm uplifted by the people in the streets in Myanmar right now, challenging the military uh, government, the military coup that just took over the, 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 the country. I'm uplifted by the farmers protests in India that have now stretched weeks, huge, massive movements of people in India. I'm uplifted by Bobby Wine, who is still hiding out at his house in Uganda after challenging Museveni in the most recent Ugandan presidential election. I'm uplifted by, of course, the tremendous strength of the movement for Black lives here in the United States, which has been uh, uh, so powerful and uh, over the last decade, but especially over the last eight months. I'm uplifted by the music that we're seeing coming out and we have for decades that challenges some of these unjust hierarchies and structures. And certainly last but not least in the at all, I'm uplifted by the way in which we see uh, an intersectional lens uh, focused on the way, fo uh, draw our attention to the way in which caring for each other caring for each other in a politics of care and of love and of mutual aid is something that actually is has potential to radically transform society in part because it foregrounds a politic of difference and it rejects at its very core the way in which me, uh, the way in which um, the the systems that exist now will not save us it, it rejects this idea that the systems that that, that exist uh, today are not ones that merely can be reformed, but they must be transformed. And so certainly this you know, kind of trunk of a car uh, in Queens, New York, this is how so many New Yorkers were fed during COVID-19. Um, the Black Panthers on the left um, had had the largest feeding program, uh, it, you know, in 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 the 1960s and 70s. Uh, the feeding program, because these were this was a recognition of the way in which the state was failing, um, and the way in which markets were failing to ensure that everybody was not hungry. Um, the way in which here, even in Denver, in our own city, we we saw last spring the kind of creation of mutual aid stations and, and stations to really help support people that were um, in the streets uh, uh, fighting for justice and fighting against police violence. Um, and the way in which these these kind of uh, create this creation of alternative infrastructures for for focused on care um, is a way of then really kind of. Uh, uh, disrupting the 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 kind of um, uh, oppressive systems that we see creating so much of the harms that all of you were able to hopefully articulate and put at the center of your circles, right? And I think what this all of these 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 movements really remind me is that there is no blueprint for creating social change, and there is no blueprint necessarily for how to create intersectional coalitions. But it's essential for us to think about how to not replicate and reify hierarchy as we begin to build movements for, for, for better worlds. Intersectional coalitions, coalitions that cut across race and class and gender and sexuality and gender expression and orientation and, and caste and religion and every other form of difference are essential because a harm against one is a harm against all. The way in which we all live in ecosystems that are completely connected is a, a, a way of understanding how unraveling one bit of harm over here on that circle does not actually unravel the, the structures that are, are truly at the root of the oppressions and harms that we see in the world in the first place. And so building these intersectional coalitions is essential. We remind ourselves in doing so that linear progress isn't guaranteed. Sometimes there are setbacks and sometimes there are disappointments and failures, right? In, in, these, in these processes. But visioning, being reflective of our own position, thinking about ethics and what we value and accountability to communities that we are uh, advocating purportedly on behalf of, being accountable to others. These are all values I think that are really important to me as I think about the work that needs to be done.
And I ask you to think to yourself about what are the values that are important for you? What are the values um, for me, the number one values, two values that I live by are non-hierarchy and non-oppression, right? And so, you know, what for you, what are the what are some of those values that you might take forward to actually more successfully build intersectional coalitions? And how can we think think about change, not only as burning it down or as revolution, because we know that that's not where we're at, but instead think about incremental change, but that is consistent with those broader values that serves the purpose of getting to that vision in the future. I was, I was also uplifted by a recent book by Dean Spade, um, Mutual Aid, who offers what I see here, they offer a set of of questions that we might ask ourselves when we're seeking to do work and we're seeking to kind of build coalitions to create change, right? And these four questions I think are really helpful. Does it provide material relief? Is what we're doing gonna help take, you know, the, the boot off of somebody's neck? Um, does it leave out an especially marginalized part of the affected group, right? So like people, like, so thinking about the suffrage movement, does it leave, does it leave out black women who are going to face different barriers being able to cast their vote, right? Does it legitimize or expand the system we are seeking to dismantle by sending people to prison, for instance, is a, is a way or advocating for people's conviction or advocating for more policing. These are ways of, of deepening uh, and, and making more robust those systems. Does it mobilize people, especially those that are directly impacted for ongoing struggle? Is it actually one are, is my action or our or, or actions as a, as a coalition beginning to um, think about that long-term vision and how we get there, okay? So I find these to be really um, sort of useful questions when, when we kind of come to that question of, of, of how do our values, how are they necessary, right? Um, how, are, how are values necessary to really ensure that we do not have intersectional failures and that we actually are able to build coalitions that can be sustained, that can be, that can forge strength in difference and that can keep progress moving towards that vision we have of building a better world. All right, that's all from me, everybody. So please feel free to reach out if you have any questions or clarifications or anything else to my email, marie.berry at du.edu. You can also find me on Twitter uh, at Marie E. Berry. Um, and lots of other ways to get in, in, uh, to get a hold of me. So I'm going to stop my screen share now. We have about 10 minutes left, but I know there's not too many of you. So if anyone has any questions, um, I invite you to chime in. Um, questions or anything else that's come up and otherwise, I will. Thanks, AJ. Marie, thank you. This has been really so valuable and given me so much. I'll be thinking about this for days now. So I'll try to save them up and maybe email you. But this was really so wonderful. And I wish there were more people here to make it more of a workshop. So you also pivoted really nicely to, to, to deal with that. But this, this was awesome. Dennis, thanks so much. That's so kind and generous. And you know, it's like, at least, you know, we have a recording and, and, and to be honest, as Mari said, I talk about this stuff all the time. So it's, it's nice to have a chance to talk about it in, in a different context. And, and I'm glad you were here. Value that very much. Well, I was, I feel very fortunate to have heard you today. So thanks. Thanks, Dennis. Are there any questions or anything else? All right, everybody. So feel free to reach out. Feel free to shoot me an email anytime. And uh, thank you all for being here. I'll turn it back over to you, Mari. Thank you so much, Dr. Barry. Uh, I'll just echo what our lovely participants said and say how incredible that was to hear. Uh, as a final reminder, for those of you who did join us live today, you will receive an email with a link for a session evaluation. We greatly appreciate your feedback. Uh, and thank you for sticking with us despite that technological error. Um, please view the online schedule and register for our upcoming Diversity Summit sessions as well. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope you'll join us for our next panel at 4 p.m. today about the LGBTQIA community.